We're in a series of messages right now called Life in a New World. We are definitely living in a new world. There are so many things that are happening now that we haven't gone through before, especially in the combination of the way they're, they're happening. There's a pandemic. Y'all have heard about that, right? There's a pandemic going around. The economy has been struggling. Many people have lost their jobs, and it's caused a, a lot of stress uh, on people because of that. The political environment has been so, uh, so hard as well as there's been division and frustration and all of those struggles that are there. There's so many things that are going on. So how is it that we live in this new world? I mean, how is it that we deal with it? Well, I want to talk with you today about how we can do that. And one of the ways in which we do it is through something called relationships. God created us for relationships. God created us to be in community with each other. And there are a lot of different uh, reasons we get together in community. Sometimes it's common interests that we have. Jennifer and I were walking uh, down next to the riverfront yesterday and downtown, and there were some kayakers who were there together. And I looked at Jennifer. I said, you know what that is, Jennifer? It's community. That's what it was. Because those people had interests and they'd built relationships with each other and now have this bond together. A lot of the reasons that we have these bonds it might be friends. It might be uh, spouses, uh, people you're dating, kids, you know, siblings. I mean, I, the list goes on and on and on and on. But in each of those relationships, we are to be people who behave in the same way. We're to be people who are motivated by the same thing, and it's called love. I know you're shocked that I would say that, right? But it's the energy behind everything that we are to do in our relationships. One of the scriptures that's used most often in wedding ceremonies is referred to as the love scripture because it defines for us what love is. And I really love it because it tells us exactly how we behave if we love other people. And I want to begin that way today by looking at it. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Here's the definition. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. That's what love is. That's exactly what love is. And when we love in this way, something happens in our relationship. We are at peace. When you have two people who act in this way toward the other, there is peace because there's no reason for there to be conflict. But we know that's not necessarily the case in our relationships. One of the things that has happened because of the pandemic is relationships have become very strained in many situations, whether it's because of how much time is spent in the home or because... Uh, the economic situation within the family may be different. We know that there are a lot of struggles that are going on right now because of it. But I want to give you hope today. No matter what type of relationship that you have, you can make a difference in it. And you can make the world a better place in this new world that we live in. It all starts with love, but we've got to have enough of it. So on your outline sheet, put number one. It says this, I need to love deeply. I need deep love. I need, I need so much love that I'm able to love no matter what is happening toward me from another person. The scripture talks about this deep love. Peter wrote it in 1 Peter 4. Above all, love each other deeply. Everybody say deeply. Deeply. Love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. I love that because when it talks about covering over a multitude of sins, you can think about that in a couple of different ways. One is this, because of my love that I won't sin. So fill in that next statement on your sheet. It keeps us from sinning. Because I love this much, I'm not going to do these things that are hurtful and harmful to other people. In other words, when I love, I will be patient. When I love, I won't envy. When I love, I won't be promoting myself. When I love, I won't feel like I'm more valuable than other people. When I love, I won't tear people down. When I love, I won't use people for my benefit. When I love, I won't get angry. And when I love, I won't be bitter. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? 
I won't be those things. You know what those things are if you do them? They have a name. It's called sin. All those things that he just talked about in love, when we do the opposite of what we're supposed to be doing, it's sin. So if I love deeply, I'm not going to do those things. That sounds pretty cool, right? So if I do those things, it means I have a problem with my love, that I'm not loving deeply enough. Well, how can we tell this? How can we tell if we're loving enough? Uh, Y'all have heard this statement before, think before you say and think before you do. Y'all have heard that before? And that's very true. One of the ways we know we love the other person is if we do what I just said. If I stop and think about what I'm going to say before I say it, if I stop and think about my behavior before I do it. Now, why would I do that? Because I want to be careful to make sure that the person that I'm talking to or behaving toward knows that I love. See, the problem is many people don't stop and think before they say and behave. What they do is they act on reflex. It's a reflex kind of love. Remember, we can have a love toward them or we can have a love toward ourselves. And usually the reflex love uh, looks like this. Somebody does something to us and we in reflex get ticked off, right? We get angry. We get upset with them because of it. Somebody does something, we immediately become, uh, become bitter. Somebody does something, we immediately become impatient. It's a reflex thing that we do. And I'll just say this, that if we, if we act out in reflex, that's not love. That's not love for another person. It's a love for ourselves because we're being controlled by what people are doing to me who I love more than anybody else. But if I stop and if I think Before I speak and before I do, it says, I love you. Love you so much that I'm willing to do this very thing. Well, let's look at something else. It is the motivation to forgive those who have sinned. It's the motivation to forgive those who have sinned. Uh, Again, when people do things against us, Um, many times we want to get them back. And what we know is that God is a forgiving God. We can't overcome conflict in a relationship unless there's forgiveness. Y'all do realize that, right? There has to be forgiveness. If there's conflict, there has to be forgiveness. So we have to be those people who are willing to forgive the other person for what they've done. Why would we want to do that? It's because we love them. How do we know if, how do we know if we really have forgiven them? Well, here's here's the way. Here's here's a really quick way. There are other ways, I'm sure, but here's a quick way. You, the one who is forgiven, the other person, never talk about it again. Does anybody have that problem where you like to bring up things that people do to you that they've done, or is it just me, right? And don't you just love to do it at the most opportune moments, right, where it stings really good, that person, because you want to bring it back up? Y'all, that's not forgiveness, It's not forgiveness at all. What that is, is power. And it's power that you are trying to use to hurt somebody else. And that is not love. So how much do we love people? How much do you love people? That's a big question that we ask. Number two on our sheet, let's look at this. I need relationships with those who are wise. So the first thing is, again, I need this deep love because it you know, it, it, has, it makes a difference in my behavior. Here's, we need relationships with people. I'm going to call them counselors. All right. We need people who are counselors for us. The scripture says this. It says it in Proverbs, Proverbs 13. Walk with the wise and become wise. For a companion of fools suffers harm. So it tells us that we're to walk with the wise because if we walk with the wise, then we become wise. In other words, if we walk with the wise, they help us to grow. They help us to be better, and that's who we're supposed to be. Now, the reason why I call them a counselor is because we need counsel. Now, some people go to a counselor. They pay to go to a counselor, and that's cool if you do that. A lot of people do that. I've done that uh, before myself. But that's not necessarily what I'm talking about. Yes, it can be a way we need counselors, but we need people in our lives that we would say, he's a counselor for me, or she's a counselor for me. I have a person like this in my life. Uh, I have a prayer partner that I've been praying with for 20, 
I think, 21 years. 21 years, every Wednesday at 1.30, we pray with each other, and we do it by phone because years ago he moved to another place. At one time he was over our prayer ministry here, and they moved up to Brandon, go to a different church up there. For 21 years on Wednesdays, we've been praying with each other. And the cool thing about it is that we get to talk to each other about struggles that we're going through in our lives. Every week, we do the same thing, okay? We talk about anything going on with your family, anything. What about you personally? Are you struggling with anything? And what's been cool for me is when I've said some things, Wade is a counselor for me. And Wade will pick up something that I said that was coming not from a, necessarily a godly place because I wasn't thinking of it in the right way. And he brings my attention to think about it in a very different way, the way God would want me to think of it. Say, I have areas in my life that I need to grow. I know that, big time I know that, and I need somebody to counsel me to help me to do that. Now, here are a couple of things that a counselor needs to do. These are people that you need in your life. First of all, it has to do with purpose, so let's fill this in. They help me learn my purpose. What is my purpose? I've shared this many times. In fact, I did it, I think, just last week. When Jesus came to this earth, he had a purpose. And that purpose, he said this of himself, he called himself the Son of Man, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That was Jesus' purpose. That also is our purpose. Who is lost? Those people who are lost are people who have misdirected their love, not toward God, but toward something else. Those are lost people. So what I'm supposed to do, this is what I'm supposed to do with my life. I'm supposed to love like God loves, you know, see these people this way. And I am to find those people who are loving things that are causing difficulties in their life because they're not loving God. That's my purpose. Now, you probably know people in your life, either in family or friends or whoever, don't have a relationship with God, or maybe they do have a relationship with God, but they, some other thing has become very important to them and more important to them than God is right now. They need counsel. When that happens to me, I need counsel. I need somebody to help me see that I'm getting off the path. But think of this. There are many people who don't have a relationship with God who never have come to know his love. Y'all, we need to seek them and find them and give them counsel. But it's also to remind us as believers that we need counsel. Here's another thing, and I love this. They help me see people in the right way. Um, you know, when... When somebody does something to you and it's hurtful toward you, it's easy for us to have that reflex reaction and get angry or bitter or, you know, annoyed or whatever it is. Uh, it's easy for us to act out that way. And it's easy for us to want to hurt that person because of what they did to us. And what we need to be is we need to be people who don't just see the behavior. We need to think about why they may be behaving the way they're behaving, all right? This is, uh, this is true, again, of me. Anybody who's in leadership, if you lead people, you know, it could be a small number or a large number. Actually, it's anybody. Anybody can deal with this. The larger number of people you lead, the more susceptible you are to this. People have opinions. Have you realized that? Did you know that people in churches have opinions? <gasps> what? Right? And sometimes those opinions aren't necessarily my opinion, and sometimes there's conflict. And y'all, people are so, this hardly ever happens to me. Hard, I'm just telling you, hardly ever happens to me. But there have been times in my past where somebody uh, didn't agree with me and said some things to me, and, you know, and I am a person who's past. I filter some things in my life through some things that were said to me in my past from my childhood, and it just puts me in a weird place, Okay. And sometimes I take it very personally, and when I do that, you know, it causes problems for me. What we do is we see people who act out like that toward us. We call, we call them toxic people. It's like poison. I mean, they're just terrible for you. Well, I was reading this past week an article from a counselor, all right? And it was awesome because this counselor said, there are no toxic people. This is what she said. There are no toxic people, there are angry people, there are hurt people, there are people stuck in patterns of addiction, there are people who are trying their best to navigate life after trauma, there are people who have lived and breathed abuse and know nothing else, there are people who are depressed, 
There are people with feelings of low self-esteem. There are people who have an urge to always please others. There are people who have a lack in confidence. There are people who are grieving. There are people who are financially struggling. They are people who are hurting. When I read that, it completely changed how I think about people. Even though I know this is true, I don't stop and think about people this way. There was a situation years and years ago where I had somebody, and it was one of these conflict things. I took it really personally, and poor pitiful me, you know, it was one of, one of those things. And I started having really bad feelings toward this person, and Jennifer came to me. She is the perfect counselor for me. Oh, she absolutely is. And she said, Tim, did you realize he just lost his job? And I didn't realize he had just lost his job. And now all of a sudden, oh, maybe that's why he's acting out the way he is. And then it flipped from me thinking about me to having a concern for the other person. We need people in our lives. Y'all, we need counselors in our lives who will, like a Jennifer, who sees us and wants us to make sure that we see other people in the right way. I mean, think about counseling. That's what counseling is altogether, isn't it? You go to counseling because you want to see things about yourself and the struggles that you have. But a counselor will help you see other people in the right way. And that's what we're supposed to do. All right, number three. We're getting through number four today, okay? So we'll stop there because, again, I don't want you all to freak out. Number three, I need to give up. I need to give up. And that doesn't sound right. I understand that. But when you look at it, in a spiritual way, it's going to make complete sense. John 13, a new command I give you. This is Jesus. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my, my disciples if you love one another. And when you look at that, it's like, I don't get it. You know, the new command, what is the whole new command? I mean, we've heard this before, right? I'm to love God and I'm to love others. But what did he say? What was the new command? Let me, let me read it again. As I have, let me go back. A new command I give you, here it is. Love one another, we've heard that. But then it says this. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. That's the new command. So I'm supposed, this is my, the command to me. I am supposed to love other people the way Jesus loved people. So how is it that he loved people? Listen to what the scripture says in John 15. We hear the same theme. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. This is Jesus talking. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Listen, my command is this. Here it is. Love each other as I have loved you. That's the new command, right? Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love, this is cool because then he tells us what, it, what that is. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. So that's what it is to love others like Jesus loves. Then verse 17 said, this is my command to love each other. So what is he saying? We are to sacrifice. Uh, on your sheet, fill that in. We are to sacrifice. We're to be willing to give something up for the good of other people. We can know the level of a person's love by how much they're willing to sacrifice. So we can say this, I love you this much, which means I'm willing, I love you this much because I'm willing to give this much up for you, right? Or I love you this much because I'm willing to give up this much for you. Or I love you this much, <laughs> right? Did you not like my, I thought that was beautiful, what I just did. What is that? I'm willing to give my life for you. I love you. That's what I need to do with Jennifer today. Jennifer, I just love you. Are we willing to give up ourselves for other people? Are we willing to do that? I, uh, Jennifer and I, I, I know I'm talking a lot about her today, but, you know, it's good things, and sometimes it's not. Okay, so anyway, uh, and I, I'm just kidding around when I say other things, by the way. If you're new, don't hate me, okay? It, it, it's good. We were uh, watching uh, television this week, this past week, and she loves to, she's a brain person. She loves to hear about, you know, read about brain stuff, talk about brain stuff. So, you know, I just, that's cool. So she starts talking about brain stuff, and I just go to my happy place and wait for her pause and then go back and see if I can 
think of a question to ask, and then I go back to my, you know, it's one of those kind of things. But she was watching a, a documentary that, well, it wasn't a documentary, it was this guy who's an expert on happiness, and he, um, so he was talking about he was talking about happiness, what brings happiness. What we know is, this is what, and I talked about this last week, scientifically, we know that one of the things that gives us the most happiness, in fact, I said this last week in a study, that it's the relationships that we have with each other. Scientifically, that's what we learn, that it's this way. So this is basically what he was talking about. But he posed the question, how much are you willing to give up for another person? So he gave the illustration, he said this, that if you saw, if your dog was out in the river drowning and a person that you didn't know was also out in the river drowning, which one would you go and rescue? That's a good question, isn't it? Now we know as Christians what we're supposed to say, right? But he said in a lot of the audiences, a lot of the people would say they would save their dog. Why? Because it's a love they have for their dog. It's a love that they have for their dog. Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't feel that way about us? Aren't you glad that he was that way? We need to have a love that that is it's that strong that we're willing to do things for other people. Okay, let's talk about sacrifice a little bit more because I don't know how many of you are going to have to die today for somebody that you love. Probably none of you. Okay, maybe so, but maybe not. Well, there's some other ways in which we can sacrifice. I'll give you two quick examples. One is through uh, money, all right? We give up something that we want to buy, and instead of buying that, we give something to somebody else. We buy something for somebody else. That sacrifice, you give up something for the good of others. Here's the other one, though, that I think all of us can do and start practicing if we're not. It's the sacrifice of time and what you do with your time. Uh, again, I keep going back to my relationship with, with Jennifer because it's the closest one I have. And I, I, I mentioned this a couple of times a while back ago that, you know, she made some comment to me about, it's amazing to me how you can put the dishes on top of the dishwasher and can't get them in the dishwasher. And then the Holy Spirit came upon me in the room and convicted me, okay? And I felt really bad because, you know, for... 30-something years that we've been married, I've always felt like there are two dishwashers, the automatic one and Jennifer. Okay, it wasn't me. I didn't dishwash. So she said this to me, and then I started thinking, you know, that it's terrible that I haven't done this. So I started washing the dishes. Now, at first, I kept saying to her, hey, I just wanted you to know that I washed the dishes. I was wanting to get credit. You know, I was, and that's not really the right way to do it. But eventually, I just started washing the dishes every time she does a meal. And, you know, there are times like, Jennifer, did you really need to use that many pans? I mean, I really feel that way sometimes. So I didn't have to have that part of them. It's okay. But there's a bunch of it. But now I just don't really complain. I just wash the dishes. It takes me time to wash it. I could be watching Hallmark instead of washing the dishes. I could be watching a game instead of washing the dishes. But I take my time and sacrifice what I would have done to wash the dishes. Y'all, I'm not a good person. I was evil before. Did you not hear the, the thing? Here's another thing. Uh, making the bed. I've said this before. Y'all, making the bed. It takes me a little time to make the bed. And the more pillows she adds, the longer it takes. And now she's put some kind of blanket on the crazy bed. Okay, so now it's like, how much time do I really have? But I, you take the time to do it because it's a blessing to her to do it. Am I willing to make the sacrifice in just a few minutes of my time to make somebody feel like they're loved? So that's my question to you. Are there people around you that you say you love, that you could give up some time to do something good for them? And maybe it's on a regular basis, maybe it's not, but to do something good for him. Here's them. Here's the reason why you do it. It's because you want to serve them. It's not only sacrifice, it's to serve. Here's the reason why we serve. Because all of us, here's what service has to do with. Service has to do with need. I serve you because you have a need. I want to meet that need. Here's the need that all of us have. I've already been talking about it. Here's the need that all of us have. We need to feel loved. Every person has the need to feel loved. So that's why we serve somebody and do something for them because we want to meet that need for them so that they feel loved significant, that they feel like somebody cares about them, that they feel loved. That's why we do it. 
Number four. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we are to live with joy. Oh, I'm so glad you flipped that up because this is good. We are to live with joy. This is what uh, Jesus said. Jesus said, when I see you out there doing this, you make my joy complete. And when you're out there loving other people, you make your own joy complete. That's what he said in the scripture. All right, you're to love like I love you, all right? Love like I, so when I see you doing that, you make my joy complete, man, because you do this. And when you do it yourself, you're making your own joy complete yourself. And y'all, this is so important to us. I, again, uh, we've, we've learned in the last few weeks about happiness, and there's a difference between happiness and joy because happiness is temporary and joy is lasting. Okay, here's happiness. I do something for myself to make me happy. I want you to make sure you hear that, okay? I do something for myself to make me happy. I do something for other people to experience joy. Y'all see the difference? I do something for myself to make me happy, but when I do something for other people, it gives me joy. Now you say, Tim, you just talked about the study last week where a secular study that it said that happiness, uh, the greatest happiness comes when you uh, through relationships and where you do things for other people. Yes, that's true. But see, what they're calling happiness is really joy. You know, the reason why they say that's the most important thing is because it really is joy. It's what we're looking for that lasts. I'll explain it to you this way. It's this, if you do something for somebody else, you are living up to who God created you to be, to show love to that person, and you are making a positive impact in the life of that other person. Why do you think it completed Jesus' joy when he saw people who were affected by him? Because he did something for them that affected their life. And we do things to other people that affect their life. And you say, Tim, but what if they don't give their life to Christ? What if they don't look to God? I can promise you, you can still look back on that moment in your life, even if if they don't respond in a positive way toward God and still feel joy because you know that you showed love. And when they think back to that moment, they're going to remember that somebody loves them. That's where joy comes from. When we do things for other people. And God wants us to experience that joy. You know, I, and it's the thing that matters the most. I've done four funerals in the last five weeks. And... Some of them, a couple of them I was super close, well, three of them I was really, really close with, and the other one uh, I didn't know as well. But here's the thing about funerals. Not one time have I ever been to a funeral or have I done a funeral and said some things like this about the person. Y'all, they had the biggest boat you have ever seen in your life. You wouldn't believe their house. I mean, it has six bedrooms. It's crazy. I've never said anything like that at all about a person. Do you know what you say in a funeral is you tell how that person affected the lives of other people. And sometimes it's really easy and sometimes it ain't. And we're to be that type of a person. And you know, those people who look at them, and, and they all can find moments like that because of family, they all can. But did you know that's the reason why we can find joy in the midst of grief in a funeral service? Because we know they left the legacy of God's love. Number four uh, is this I need to encourage and build. This is really good. In uh, 1 Thessalonians, uh, Paul said this Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. So it's encourage them, build them. And they were, they were practicing this, and we should too. This is what encourage means. It means to inspire with courage, spirit, or confidence. It's not on your sheet. But the three points that I'm about to give you are that description or definition of encouragement. First of all, we inspire them to be courageous. So when I encourage somebody, what I do is, is I inspire them not to give in to the pressures of the world that are trying to get you to live for things or do things that are going to hurt you. Be courageous and stand up in the face of those things that people are trying to get you to do. That's actually encouragement, to be strong. Here's the second thing. It's we inspire them to feel positive. When we encourage people... We shouldn't be the kind of person when somebody sees us that we like totally bring that person down, right? 
oh, here comes Tim, <coughs> you know, that they're just depressing people. That's not it. When we encourage people, we inspire them. What does it say? We inspire them to feel more positive about their life. No matter what you're going through in your life, let me tell you something. God loves you. God is with you. I am with you and will stand with you. And there is nothing in your life that can control who God created you to be. We encourage people through that through their value, that they have value. Here's the, the third thing. We inspire them to be confident. What is that? The confidence is different than courage because confidence says this. I am confident that I can make a difference. I can make a difference. Say that with me. I can make a difference. Say it one more time. I can make a difference. So we look at that person, they feel like, man, my life is, you probably met people like this. Man, my life is going nowhere. Things are terrible. This is whatever, you know. And what we do in encouragement is, you know what? God uses every experience in our past to build our faith in him and to help us see that we are still usable by God. And I can promise you, God is gonna use you in your future to inspire confidence in people that God has a plan for you, that God is gonna use you to make a difference. But it's very hard for us to get through this. Why? Actually, it's because of that second thing that I talked about, because we get so depressed about our life. We're, we put so much attention on the big meanies that are doing stuff to us or this bad thing that happened to us or this bad thing that happened to us. And then we get depressed about this because we're allowing all of these situations and circumstances in our life to control us. And what God wants us to do is, is remind us it's not about that. It's about who you know personally. I want to end with this, all right? It's not on your outline sheet. If you want to write this scripture down, in the notes, there's notes places on your, even your app, you can type something in if you want to. This scripture is found in Psalm 42. Psalm 42 is verses 6 through 11. The psalmist who wrote this was going through exactly what I'm just talking about. Just really bad stuff that was happening to him, and he let it get to him. This is what he said, but he, he also talked about the solution. This is what he said. My soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you. Talking about God. From the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar, deep calls to deep and the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. And then he goes dark again. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? And then he gets positive again. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. It was all about relationship. He started thinking about the relationship. Do you know how you can start thinking about the relationship? I, I love the beginning of this. It said this, my soul is downcast within me, therefore I will, remember, I will remember you. Then it said this, from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, and from Mount Mizar. You know what he remembered? When God did great things. He looked back in his life and he looked back at what God had done. And instead of thinking about all this terrible stuff that was going on in his life, what did he do? He thought back about great things that God had done in his life where God had showed him his love. You know what happens? Depression goes. Joy comes back. Y'all, we're to be people expressing that kind of love to each other. Last thing, all right. We're to be people who make waves. Let me read the scripture. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. Then he says this, by day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. Here's the thing. We're to make waves. Y'all heard of people saying that, man, they're making waves. And normally it's a bad thing that bad things are happening. They're making waves, but y'all, we need to make good waves. 
When we do something of love, that love washes over people. In fact, that's what the scripture just helped us see, that the love of God washes over us. And every time we do something of service and sacrifice for someone else, the love of God through you washes over them. We need to be making waves. The other day in the first message, I talked about being an ambassador and I said, we need to go out and walk. And I gave you an idea about using a sock, you know, put a sock over your pants or whatever it is to remind you every day that, you know, I'm supposed to go out and be an ambassador. And I have a sock every day. Well, this past week I did something else. I started thinking about this wave, about making a wave. So I found this little graphic of a, a wave and I put on top of that graphic of this wave, make a wave. And I saved that picture. So now every time I see that picture, it's a reminder, what am I going to do to make that wave today? Where the love of God washes over people. Every time you see a drip of water drop in the water in your sink, you're supposed to make a wave. Anytime you see a drop hit the bath water, you see the ripple. Let's make a wave. You see, that's the way it is. They have a ripple effect. Can you imagine what all of us would be doing? What little amount of your time this week could you use to do something good for other people? I asked Cain uh, to do this song this weekend. It's called uh, The Wave of God. Waves of Love. The Wave of Love. <laughs> the Wave. Did y'all hear God just speak to me to correct me? I didn't know he was from Australia, though. That's what I didn't understand. The Ways of Love. Cain, sing it for us. <laughs> Cover me in the 
God, I thank you so much for what you taught us today. And God, I do pray that we would make a wave. I pray, God, that as your love is just washed over us through what Jesus has done for us and his sacrifice on the cross, showing love, God, for someone who doesn't deserve it in us. God, may we be the people who go out and share that love, God, through the sacrifices we make, no matter what that may look like, to help people know that in a dark world, there is light through the hope of your love. Use us, God. Use us to bring honor to you, but use us, God, to help people find the love that they need. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.